10,000 acres burned. 33 homes have been destroyed by fire. Also destroyed 21 barns and 45 vehicles. Firefighters say a deep layer of brush is making the forest floor burn like charcoal. Terrified and confused, animals are running both in and out of the danger. Well, by later tonight, firefighters are hoping to gain 100% control of the largest wildfire complex currently burning in Oregon. It's already burned 45,000 acres, and firefighters hope to gain control of the blaze after rainfall on Sunday helped slow the spread of the fire. Firefighters hope to save nearly 200 homes threatened by the fire. At some point in time, you have been in your houses in the, in the evening and you have been watching the news. And on that news report, you have watched video clips of uncharacteristic high severity fire burning through the landscape, consuming thousands of acres. And in that video clip, you see that lives are threatened and houses are threatened. And how does that play into the historical role? Is that the type of fire behavior that we saw throughout the Western United States. Historically, particularly in Ponderosa Pine dominated ecosystems, we saw low severity fires. If we could go back in time, we would see surface fires burning through the understories of many of our forested ecosystems. Many years ago, um, Native Americans they were very in tune to that natural role of fire and they exploited it through hunting and gathering and they also saw some uh, spiritual significance with how fire burned and where it burned. Right now our larger landscapes are um, very homogeneous. You have this continuous forested landscape that is overstocked with trees due to decades of fire suppression. And what prescribed fire can do is it brings in a variability and a mosaic within that landscape. And the more of a mosaic that we can bring into this landscape, the more of a benefit there is for wildlife and the more assurance that we're maintaining habitat for all of the species. Fire was the most important factor in maintaining those forest features. And so if we understand that, then we put fire back into these systems trying to restore again those, those functional components of fire, establishing the diversity of species, uh, the species that exist under the forest structure. If you can imagine your backyard. So each spring you go in and you trim your trees, you take out the dead branches and you allow the tree more growing room. And this during the summer, you mow your yard many times. In the fall, you rake the leaves. So what I'd like you to do is envision allowing your lawn to continue to accumulate leaves and branches and allow your grass to grow. Uh, freely throughout the year and then what I'm going to do is we're going to we're going to fast forward 10 years into the future. Now look at your yard. The grass is tall, seeds from your neighbor's trees have seeded into your lawn taking out more uh, lawn space. You have increased accumulation of leaves and litter on the bases of your trees. Now if you were to try to take your lawnmower in there you wouldn't be very successful without doing some type of prior treatment. So as these ecosystems depended on fire to maintain the amount of fuel accumulation, the amount of leaf litter and needle debris that you saw in your backyard, as your backyard depends on you for maintenance, so did the forested ecosystems depend on fire to maintain this ecosystem in a state that was in a healthy condition and sustainable. From a, from a fire manager perspective, 
the, the mission of our service is to benefit wildlife and wildlife habitat. But as a fire manager, I also have to uh, look at, at wildfires and the safety of my crews. And you know, a part of that is how can we change dynamics of, of the vegetation that's out there on, on the landscape um, through, through fuels manipulation, through changing the fuel loading um, or how that plants, shrubs, trees, whatever they are, how they, they line up against one, one another. We have the ability to make the wildfire environment safer for our crews when they do need to go out and suppress a fire. Now, uh, smoke is a byproduct from all the burning that we do, whether it's the prescribed burning or the, the wildfires, um, um, all create smoke. Um, so one of the things that we, we talk about and, and discuss here is uh, the trade-offs of whether or not prescribed fire smoke is a, is a, a bad thing or compare that to wildfire smoke. So uh, with a wildfire, cer certain things are out of our control. Uh, certainly uh, we want to go contain the fire as soon as we can and, and, and catch it, but uh, sometimes we may not have that ability. Um, may not have enough resources. The fire fire behavior may just be too much for the for the folks to be able to get in there and get around it. So uh, um, we're very limited on the amount of control that we have over the smoke when we have a wildfire. So the trade-off here is that we could potentially go out here and uh, do some prescribed burning and uh, cause a lot less smoke. Um, and uh, at least um, the smoke that we're creating is manageable. So aspen stands are important for a lot of different wildlife species and again due to decades of fire suppression a lot of our aspen stands are not in very good health. So often we purposely burn our aspen stands and aspen is a tree that regenerates very well. They're actually stimulated by prescribed burning. What it does is it burns the understory, which can become decadent over time, and you get new growth. And that new growth has more nutritional value, and it also increases the abundance of the forage, such as the wildflowers, or the shrubs, or the aspen. So here we're standing in a recent prescribed fire <clears throat> located on the Lakeview Ranger District on the Fremont Wynema National Forest. It was burned in September of last fall. And here you can see there is a mule deer that's already come back and is using this area. They're probably keying in on this aspen stand that's been burned right here next to us where we have nice regeneration of young aspen. So I'm standing on the north end of Saikan Marsh, adjacent to our where I'm standing within um, 50 meters is National Forest Land. And so uh, this fire, uh, one of its objectives, working at a watershed scale, was to restore uh, the hydrologic regime. And so water coming from clouds, coming to the ground, uh, you know, getting absorbed or getting used by these plants. Um, when we have overstocked stands, uh, we often are looking at situations where there isn't really any extra water, there's no residual water to be used. And, and so then the marsh, all the water is staying up here, it's not moving through the watershed and moving back on toward the marsh. And so um, we're, this is August uh, 2011, and a year ago at this time, Saikan Marsh was basically dry. And so one of the objectives of this burn was in restoring the uh, hydrologic regime. As we, as we burned through this area, we actually monitored the water elevations in the marsh. And as, uh, as we burned the first day, we, you know, we monitored the change. And so there were actually incremental increases in the water elevation each day we burned out here over like a two week period of time. And so it's showing first of all that this, this, this watershed is resilient if we allow it to have the ability of water to come in and percolate through the soils and come back into the wetland systems and that it does move through here. And that, uh, secondly, then the plants themselves out in the marsh, they're lush, they're, they're green, 
There's water standing out in the marsh right now providing habitat for probably uh, close to 200 species of waterfowl. With, with this restoration, we, we're managing the uplands, but it's to benefit the streams and the wetlands. And so part of the bigger picture then is as we manage these whole watersheds, all these whole systems, we're trying to make sure that all these pieces are functional to what we're trying to accomplish here. Well, John, it's been great working with you over the last 10 plus years. I remember when you first started working with the Nature Conservancy up at Saikan Marsh, you know, uh, as a burn boss for us. So we'd be able to apply uh, some of those prescribed fires on uh, treatment areas. And the coyote area was one of the first ones I remember. Right. Yep. And I think that's probably one of the biggest benefits is, you know, all those different agencies working together. Um, and, you know, just us being able to, to share the expertise. So, I mean, we've got folks that have got decades of, of prescribed fire experience and then working with folks like the Nature Conservancy who are, who are trying to do the right thing on their land. It just makes sense to partner with them and, and work together. So, yeah, Fish and Wildlife, the Forest Service, the BLM, uh, and the Oregon Department of Forestry, all are cooperators with True. Nature Conservancy working together to do the right thing on the lands. Because prescribed fire is an art and not an exact science, we are continually learning. We are adapting our approaches. We are evolving with the science. We are always going back to burns uh, that we have implemented in the past to continually learn from those uh, strategies and tactics that we used. If we look at the Upper Thomas Creek prescribed burn, this area is a small fraction of our entire national forest and systems. We can use prescribed fire as a management tool to meet management objectives and schedule the times that we use prescribed fire to meet those management objectives and overall based off of the treatment effectiveness. But what we can't do is schedule wildfires.